Hello? Cool. All right, cool. Um, so we're going to go back in uh, history a bit today. Uh, a long time ago, um, there was an awesome time called the early 90s uh, <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, and it was pretty rad. And back in the early 90s, um, if your parents were awesome, then you had one of these, a 386 PC. Um, and they were pretty, pretty cool uh, back then. Uh, but by mod standards, they, they're not very powerful. I think 20 megahertz was about standard. If you had rich parents, I think it was a 40 megahertz version. You got about like 640k RAM, that kind of thing. Um, and I guess you're supposed to like do your homework on them or something, but really you just use them for playing games. And games were kind of primitive back then, kind of 3D and stuff, but there were a few games, um, like this one, Wolfenstein 3D and stuff, that actually had like full, you know, 3D color graphics and stuff. Um, and uh, that kind of blew my mind back in like 1992. And when I got older um, and got interested in programming and stuff, I wondered how the hell did they make like 3D graphics work on this like really old computers, right? Um, so, yeah, how do they make this work on slow hardware? And kind of the, the answer is that it was kind of a trick, right? There were really 2D games that were kind of like pretending to be 3D. Um, and basically, you'll see there's like a whole bunch of restrictions here, like in this game, you'll notice the walls are all the same height. Um, they're all centered on the horizon. Um, and what else? Uh, they're, all, they're all perpendicular to the floor. In fact, the whole thing is just a grid. Um, and that kind of makes and there's some other observations you can make, like there's only ever one wall per column, so per, per sort of pixel column at the top, you only get one wall. Um, the wall's height is just sort of proportional to how far away the wall is. Um, and like I said, the whole thing's really 2D, so you kind of look here, you don't see like, there's never like a wall hiding behind another wall or anything like that. Um, and the walls just, you know, get smaller as they get further away and stuff, right? Um, and this, kind of, this brings us up to, um, Ray casting, which is the technique some of these old games used, um, because there's only ever one wall per column, what you can do is you can cast a ray um, to each uh, column on your screen, so it's sort of like this, except probably more than five. Um, and all you want to do is you just want to find out uh, where's the closest wall to the player. And once you know that, uh, you have all the information you need to draw the wall, right? You can just go, oh, it's, it's that far away, so you know, make it that height, and you just move on to the next column. And that's how. Uh, they were able to get some 3D graphics working on um, such slow computers. Uh, so how do you actually find the distance to close walls? Lots of different ways to do it, I guess, but a fast way is to use something called the digital differential analyzer algorithm, and that's kind of boring, so you can look that up <laughs> if you're interested in that. Um, so anyway, today so let's talk about JavaScript. Um, so say we want to write a, an old school video game uh, in JavaScript, obviously we'd use Canvas, um, but the other thing, you know, traditionally games you use uh, program using this concept of a game loop, which is basically just a loop that goes around as fast as it can, takes input from the player, does some calculations, renders the next frame. Um, which is, is, is pretty good, but that's not usually how you write JavaScript, right? I mean, usually, you know, we set up some event handles and things like that. Usually if you, you know, go to that second infinite loop in your JavaScript, that's usually a bad thing, right? Um, so how are we going to do this in JavaScript, right? And you could try and do things with like set timeout and set interval and stuff, but they're all kind of clunky and don't really work properly. But fortunately now, there's something called uh, request animation frame, which is basically designed for doing this kind of thing. And all it does, basically, you just give it a callback, and the browser will attempt to basically call you before the next read frame. It's, I think it's not exactly guaranteed, but usually you'll end up uh, getting you know, a nice 60 FPS, and it does some nice things for you, like it'll make sure you know, if your tab is not selected that you have um, you don't keep running and that kind of thing. Uh, it's pretty simple to use. All you do is um, basically uh, inside your function, the first thing you do is register to get called again next time. And then, you know, a simple matter of just writing your game down here, do some calculations uh, and draw it on the canvas. So, uh, oh, and also you get this uh, T frame up here. This parameter is a DOM high resolution time step. Um, that's important because, like I said, the frame rate's not guaranteed, so you do want to know, if you want to make everything work nice and smoothly, um, you do want to know how long it has been since your uh, last frame was rendered. Um, and if you've ever tried to use, like, date um, for, like, trying to, like, primitively profile some JavaScript code or something, you probably know it's completely useless because the resolution is way too chunky. Um, but high-res timestamps much better. It's five microseconds or something like that. I might be getting my units wrong. Um, that's much, much higher res. So it's actually useful for something that's running 60 times a second. Cool. 
All right. Uh, oh, one other thing is dealing with user input. So in traditional game loop, what you do is the game would just say to the operating system, like, hey, tell me like the state of the input right now. So like, does the user have the, you know, are they pressing this key right right now? Um, but JavaScript, as far as I know, doesn't have a way to do that at all. JavaScript's all based on input via events, right? Um, so a simple solution for that is we still have to register for these events, um, but then we you know, just keep them somewhere um, in some kind of you know, global or something that the game loop can query uh, when it's running. Cool. So, all right, so if we put that all together, and we'll end up with something like, something like that. Okay. Cool. So we can see. All right. Yeah, it kind of works. It still looks 3D, but you know, it's a bit, um, it's a bit kind of flat and boring. So what we can do is, um, there were some like kind of cheap hacks that, that these early games used to try and uh, make things look better. Um, so the first thing is because the game's a grid, um, we can do this thing where we just make all the walls going north south a light color and all the walls going east west dark color, right? And so you do that, and the exit full screen and turn this on. That all right, and I'll make this begin. And you can see, oh, right away, that kind of gives this uh, much more like illusion of depth, right? Um, and there's nothing we call uh, we can do called um, depth queuing, right? And that's basically the idea that you know things that are further away look a bit like you know kind of grayer or something like that. And I don't know how well this will come up on the projector. Let me do that. You can see. Um, so you can like kind of see over here, you can see like the wall kind of gets a bit like darker as it down there. Um, this is really easy to do on Canvas because in Canvas you can use um, uh, HSL instead of RGB for color. And so all you do is you just um, uh, reduce the saturation um, for the walls that are further away and you don't have to do any math or calculations or anything like that, so that's cool. Um, yeah, cool. So that's about like, I've been playing around with this for a little while, it's about as far as I've got, but um, what's kind of cool about this is like, if you've ever like, you know, opened up an OpenGL textbook and there's like four by four matrices and you're like, I don't understand anything. Um, this technique's like, um, like way, way simple. Obviously it's much more limited, but um, basically if you can like figure out how to do math with like 2D vectors, then you can like do all kinds of cool things. Um, obviously the first thing you want to add in a real game is um, some 2D sprites, like all those old games had. But things like you know doing transparent walls, reflections, lighting, um, theoretically that kind of stuff should be pretty easy using this technique. So cool. So that's it.